Okay, so I'll start over. Welcome to uh, our uh, inquirers class, newcomers class. Our topic tonight is what is the Episcopal Church and where did it come from? A whirlwind tour of the history and origin of the Episcopal Church. So there are really three sections I'm gonna talk about. The first is the early history of the Catholic Church in England, the Roman, Celtic, and Saxon roots. And all three of those are important um, in that early period of English church history. And then we'll talk about the Reformation. I know that was a particular question from, who was it? Was it Sharon who asked about that? Yes. Yep. So we're gonna really talk about the Reformation, Sharon, and hopefully uh, answer at least some of your questions. I mean, you could spend a whole you know, college career on the Reformation, but, uh, but we'll do a little bit about that and how it impacted the church and cr the creation of the Church of England. And then we'll talk about the revolution and the American Episcopal Church. So how did this Church of England become the Episcopal Church in America? So really three, three different sections and we'll try to, try to get to each one. So the legend about how Christianity came to England was that Joseph of Arimathea brought the Holy Grail to uh, England um, and settled in Glastonbury. And the Grail formed the basis for some of the earliest English literature. There's a whole uh, series of books written in the early Middle Ages and the high Middle Ages and later Middle Ages all about uh, King Arthur and the Holy Grail. Um, so it becomes this very important sort of myth that helps define English identity and uh, belief. And of course it was satirized by Monty Python who are pictured there in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's the legend, okay? That's the legend. There's no real basis uh, in historical evidence for that but it becomes a really powerful sort of uh, origin story for in, uh, Christianity in England. The actual history is uh, a little more boring <laughs> that Christianity came to Great Britain uh, gradually in different waves, different missionaries from the late first century. So very early um, through the fifth and sixth centuries, you know, kind of end up in different parts of the British Isles and plant Christianity. And it kind of grows in uh, separate and local uh, ways. So there isn't, it wasn't that, that Roman Catholicism came in a monolithic way. Because if you think about it, even in Italy, Roman Catholicism was not fully formed that early. It took time, it took centuries for Roman Catholicism to evolve into a kind of unified uh, church. Um, even into the uh, late Middle Ages, um, Catholic churches in different regions had very different uh, liturgies and practices. So you had like the Sarum Rite, which was the English Catholic uh, liturgy. You had the Gallican Rite, which was the French liturgy. You had the Mozarabic Rite, which was uh, uh, Spanish, uh, all these different colors and flavors of Catholicism, of, of really Christianity. You know, Catholicism just means universal. So there's just kind of one universal Christianity that's growing and spreading all over the world. Uh, the first real division comes between Western Christians and Eastern Christians. Um, and in 1054, uh, something called the Great Schism divides what later becomes Roman Catholicism with what becomes known as Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, in the East, they spoke Greek. In the West, they spoke Latin. And uh, as the Islamic explosion happened in the 7, 8, and 9 hundreds, um, it really drove a wedge between East and West and so you have those two branches of Christianity. That was the first major separation. But in England, um, this kind of variable Christianity is growing up from that early period as well. And so there's some differences, for instance, in the kind of Christianity that grows up with a center in Ireland that becomes a very early center for uh, British Christianity. And then later 
the Roman uh, uh, version of Christianity more in the west of England. Um, and so things like uh, how are monks going to live? Uh, those are different because monastic uh, Christianity is very important in the Middle Ages and the early period there. Um, the date of Easter is calculated differently, which is interesting. Uh, in Ireland, they're, they're celebrating Easter on one day, and in uh, Canterbury, they're celebrating it on a different day. Um, much like today, uh, Easter is celebrated differently uh, in the Eastern Orthodox world as it is from the Catholic and Protestant world. Um, there are different ways to kind of come at that based on the Jewish calendar, which I won't go into, but it's a lunar calendar. And when you impose the lunar calendar on the solar calendar that we have, uh, you can come up with different dates. Um, it, that's a topic for another time. But just, just to say tonight that, that there, there were these regional differences um, and this diversity of Christianity um, later becomes an issue, which we'll see. We also get stories. We don't have a lot of history from the early, early period of, uh, of uh, Christianity in Britain, but we do have stories of early martyrs, those who died for their faith. And uh, the earliest story that I'm aware of is about St. Alban, who was a Roman soldier. It's debated whether he lived in the third or fourth century, but still pretty early. And uh, he was a pagan um, Roman soldier. The Romans were occupying Britain. And there was a missionary priest. We don't really know where he was from, if he had come from Ireland or from the continent. Uh, but he was fleeing from uh, a ruler or a leader probably a, a British uh, prince. Uh, there were different chieftains, you know, uh, not, there wasn't a unified country. There were all these little chieftains. So anyway, he's fleeing from this impious prince and comes to Alban and, and Alban is so impressed with this priest that he shelters him in his own home. And when soldiers come to arrest this priest and execute him, he chooses to take the robes of the priest and be arrested in the priest's place. And when he's offered the opportunity to recant, he doesn't. He actually professes his faith in Christ and is beheaded by the soldiers and becomes the first known uh, martyr, Christian martyr in uh, Britain. Uh, there's a cathedral now on the site by tradition of where this happened, it's just north of London called St. Albans Cathedral. It's Saint, the town is St. Alban. And I happened to be visiting the cathedral one day when I was, I think, just out of college. I was visiting a, a buddy of mine and he had some errands to run. So he dropped me. He knew I was a church nerd. So he dropped me at St. Albans Cathedral and I was just wandering around and I saw there was something going on in the middle of the, the nave and a few people hanging around. And so I went over and lo and behold, the recently retired Archbishop of Canterbury was there. Yeah. He had just written a book. His, his name was, Ro, uh, not Rowan Williams. This was, uh, oh, which one was it? Robert Runcie. And he had just written a book. And so he was signing copies of his book. So I bought a couple of copies of the book. And uh, I think, oh, I was in seminary at the point because I talked to him about my seminary and he had visited the seminary. We had this, this great talk, so. I, I always have a fondness for St. Alban because of that. <clears throat> All right, so another famous saint you've probably heard of is St. Patrick, uh, the patron saint of Ireland, uh, who was not Irish, uh, ironically. Uh, Patrick uh, probably lived in Wales or maybe Cornwall, um, and he was a slave. He was brought, the Irish, the pagan kings of Ireland, were slavers. They would do these raids of England and bring back slaves. And so he lived in Ireland as a slave and escaped. Uh, he was then trained as a deacon and then a priest, probably went to Rome for part of his education. We don't know the whole story. But then he chose to go back to Ireland to bring this faith that he had uh, acquired um, and there's so many wonderful stories. There's a story that he was um, with his companions 
uh, in Ireland trying to proselytize and some soldiers were coming after them. And so God turned Patrick and his friends into deer mm -hmm. so that the soldiers wouldn't recognize them and would go by. Uh, and that's why one of his famous hymns is called The Cry of the Deer. Um, but anyway, uh, Patrick um, is now one of those interesting figures. He brings Christianity to Ireland, which Christianity may have already been there in some form, but Patrick is bringing his Roman Catholicism to Ireland. And so there's this interesting adaptation of Christianity um, so I believe there was this continuous kind of mixing of local uh, Irish roots of Christianity and Roman influence that helped the church to evolve uh, in Britain. So anyway, Patrick becomes a very important missionary saint. And there's no evidence that he drove the snakes out of Ireland. Just want to say there's another legend. All right, so what's happening in the rest of England in uh, the west part of England, um, the Saxons, who were German tribes, had come to uh, Britain and quickly overwhelmed the British, uh, the sort of original British uh, uh, people who lived there and the Celts, um, and quickly took control of a lot of what we now think of as England. Um, and they also, got rid of the Christianity that had just been taking root and reestablished paganism. And so in the sixth century, several things happen. One is that the Pope, the Pope Gregory the Great sends um, St. Augustine, he wasn't a saint yet, but Augustine, uh, sends him as a missionary to England um, from Rome. And so he establishes his base in Canterbury, which is now the, the center really of English uh, Christianity. That's the picture on the right-hand side. Um, so Augustine comes in and reestablishes Roman Catholicism. What I love about Augustine is that he did not want to go to England because England was violent and England was cold <laughs> and England was dark. Augustine wanted to stay in Italy where it was nice and warm and civilized, but, but he went as a very reluctant uh, apostle to England uh, in the sixth century. So Canterbury becomes a center of Roman Catholicism in England. So picture this, we've got Irish Christianity in Ireland and maybe parts of Wales, and we've got Roman Catholicism kind of percolating in different places, but with its center now in Canterbury, and then north of there, in the rest of England and Scotland, we've got paganism with the, the Gauls up in Scotland and the Saxons up in England. I don't know if you've read the wonderful book by Thomas Cahill, How the Irish Saved Civilization. Is anyone here Irish by, by descent? No Irish people? Well, it's a wonderful book about how the Irish saved civilization. And one of the ways was by uh, sending missionaries from Ireland to England. And so saints like Columba and Aidan uh, come from Ireland where they had been in these monasteries which were really centers of great learning and education and arts. Uh, the Book of Kells, if you've ever seen the Book of Kells comes out of the Irish monastic tradition. Um, they leave Ireland to, to go on these missionary trips uh, to Scotland and the north of England. Um, they establish uh, very important centers of Christianity at Iona, the island of Iona, at Lindisfarne, the Holy Isle, and at Jarrow. Um, and these become another center of Christianity. So you've got <coughs> Canterbury in the south, and then you've got uh, Jarrow and Iona and Lindisfarne in the north, and then Ireland. Uh, which are now centers by the 6th, 7th, 8th centuries now. These are the centers of, of British Christianity. But we still haven't resolved this problem. There's the Irish tradition and the Roman Catholic tradition. So in 664, um, the great saint Hilda of Whitby 
who was the leader of a very important monastery. And in the Celtic tradition, women could be leaders of co-ed monasteries. They, they, were, they, they lived celibately, but they had women and men in some of these. And Hilda was the equivalent of a bishop. There were very important roles for women in the Celtic church uh, and the Saxon church. Anyway, she's a Saxon uh, Christian, probably converted um, or her family by Irish uh, uh, missionaries. And she runs this very important monastery. And the king, I think who was a cousin of hers, King Oswiu, uh, ruled that there should be a, a synod, a, a big meeting. And the bishops from Ireland and the bishops from England were invited and they hashed out, which way are we gonna go? Are we gonna go with the Irish way or the Roman way? And it was decided uh, by the king after listening to all the bishops that British Christianity should follow the Roman Catholic model. So the Irish traditions uh, gradually fade away and Roman Catholicism takes hold. Uh, this was written about by the great um, patron saint of history, uh, my personal hero, the Venerable Bede, who wrote a very important book called The Ecclesiastical History of the English People. It's the basis for a lot of what we know about early English church history. Um, and he lived in Jarrow uh, in the yes. north of England uh, near uh, Newcastle today. So another important event, if we fast forward a few hundred years, is the Norman Conquest. Uh, the French Normans now replace the German Saxons <laughs> who had replaced or at least conquered the, the local Britons and Celts. And now a new kind of Christianity is imposed. Um, suddenly, almost overnight, all the Celtic and Saxon bishops are removed and replaced with Norman bishops, um, which must have been very shocking. The official language of Britain becomes more French. And so our language evolved. If you think of modern English, the old English is really German sounding. And uh, by the time you get to middle English, it's much more a combination of French and German uh, with some uh, local British stuff, which is why if you've ever tried, if someone's ever tried to learn English as a second language, it's nearly impossible because our language is a hodgepodge. It's a, our language is a bastard child of German, French, and other elements. Um, and so it's fascinating. We have words that derive from all sorts of uh, places. But anyway, one of the hallmarks of Norman Christianity was um, an important role for the king. So William the Conqueror and his descendants and his uh, the kings who replaced him believed that not the Pope and not the local churches, but the king should have the right to uh, appoint all bishops in the country. Uh, this was a very much a fusing of church and state. Um, and this caused conflicts because in the Celtic church, leaders were kind of raised up by the monasteries and in the Roman Catholic tradition, the Pope uh, reserved the right to appoint bishops. But now in England, the King is deciding this. And so there are flare ups of this conflict, most famously the martyrdom of Thomas a Becket, who was killed um, by soldiers of King Henry. The, famously, there's, there's a wonderful play by I think T.S. Eliot called Murder in the Cathedral. And in the play, Henry, is uh, overheard by his soldiers saying, who will rid, rid me of this meddlesome priest? Because Becket was asserting that the church should be independent. And Henry said, who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? And so his soldiers went and murdered Becket in the cathedral while he was saying mass. I point this out because this struggle between church and state becomes important in the Reformation in England, which we'll see shortly. So I know I'm racing through history, but fasten your seatbelts and then we can stop and, and take some questions. So that's part one. That's the early church uh, in England through the, the Middle Ages uh, in a nutshell. There's 
way more stuff we could cover. So let's just actually pause for a second. Thoughts, questions before we move on? Yeah, Darlene. Well, you wanted to know if there were any people that were Irish and uh, my grandfather was from Northern Ireland. He was a refugee. I have quite a few um, relatives still in Ireland. My maiden name is Wolsey. Mm. That might ring a bell, <laughs> some of you. And, um, but he left Northern Ireland because he what, because of the persecution and not being able yeah. to get work. And um, when I went over to Ireland a couple of years ago on a golf trip, I ran into some of my relatives. So it's kind oh, of- Oh, that's awesome. My name, yeah. my name, it was kind of hard not to, you know? So, um, but anyway, I just wanted to share that. So and maybe that's why I lean towards a lot of that history too. Yeah, you have it in your family. Any relation to Cardinal Woolsey? Yeah, you go back <laughs> far enough. That's how we ended up in Ireland because most of them flee because they, like in so many European countries, they don't, if someone is guilty or they feel it's guilty of a crime, they want to rid them, they would not only rid them, but they would rid their entire family so that they wouldn't get the repercussion. Um, from someone in the family. So that's how they ended up in Ireland. They actually fled after Cardinal Wolsey was um, taken back to England, but died on his way back to trial. Wow. Cardinal Wolsey uh, was an important official under Henry VIII, who we're just about to get to. <laughs> so <laughs> other, other thoughts, questions about the early history? I know you're all numb. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So now we get to Sharon's question. Tell me about the Protestant Reformation. What was that? Okay, so throughout the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church now uh, solidly an institution in the Western part. Remember, the East is, is Eastern Orthodox, but in the West, it becomes Roman Catholicism, and the papacy grows in power and prestige, um, and a number of other things happen as well. Um, the uh, certain ideas uh, become really important in the development of Christian theology. Uh, among them, the question of what happens to us when we die. And one of the answers that Catholic theologians like Thomas Aquinas and others came up with was, you know, most people are not bad enough for hell, nor are they good enough for heaven we need to come up with something else. And so they come up with the idea of purgatory and you can kind of get glimpses of purgatory in the scriptures. For instance, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he talks about the builder who builds the house kind of a faith uh, with gold and precious metals and then wood and then it's tested with fire and the builder is saved, but only as through fire. And so Aquinas and others took that idea and said, oh, this idea of a testing place, a refining place, right? The book of Malachi in the Old Testament, for he is like a refiner's fire. They developed these just couple of, of Bible passages into a whole uh, theory about how we become purified after death and made ready for heaven. And that develops into the doctrine of purgatory. And that's all well and good. It makes a lot of sense. I've always thought it's a very rational kind of a, a theory. Uh, but by the 16th century, um, it had been uh, turned into a fundraising technique. So, so in Germany, for example, um, you know, the, the Pope was building in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica. Who's ever seen St. Peter's uh, Basilica in Rome? It, it's a tiny church, isn't it? Just, yeah. you know, just <laughs> tiny. Well, so it's being built in the early 16th century. And you can imagine, I mean, I know what it takes and John Higgins can tell you what it takes to raise money just to fix 
things mm -hmm. at St. Philip's, right? Just our, just our projects. Well, imagine trying to build St. Peter's. So the Pope sends out the word to his uh, fundraising team who are all over Europe. He says, get me money for St. Peter's. And so an enterprising, uh, <laughs> an enterprising yeah. monk named Johannes Tetzel in Germany becomes, I mean, just a fantastic fundraiser. He goes all over every town and uh, according to tradition, I don't know how accurate this is, but, but his, his spiel to people was um, that no longer do you have to pray and repent uh, to, to take years off of purgatory. You just have to give money. And his, his jingle was, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> and so if you, if you were worried about your relative who, was, uh, who had died, you know, you think of today the tradition of mass cards and saying masses for the dead. Uh, that goes way back to the Middle Ages. If you go into a medieval cathedral and you'll see the main high altar and then all around there's like a, a walkway behind it and there's probably 15 chapels. You've ever seen that? Little tiny chapels in these Catholic cathedrals. Those were in the Middle Ages staffed by what were called chantry priests. And their whole job, their nine to five job was to say masses for the dead. And people would give money and their salary essentially would be paid to say masses for the dead, to pray for people in purgatory. Um, so again, wonderful. There's prayer going on. It's great. But, but uh, this, this scheme by Tetzel crossed the line. And in Germany, there was a monk, an Augustinian Catholic monk named Martin Luther, who had become a biblical scholar. So by the 16th century, if you were ordained, not if you were a layperson, but if you were ordained, you had access to printed copies now of the Bible. And uh, so Luther became a very a uh, very good biblical scholar. And so he's reading the Bible and reading particularly the letter to the Romans. And then he hears about Tetzel and his mind explodes. He cannot reconcile what he's reading in Romans that we are saved, we're justified by faith with Tetzel saying, uh, just pay me money and your relatives out of purgatory. And so uh, Martin Luther, who was a very kind of passionate guy, he writes uh, essentially a diatribe. He writes everything he hates about this. Uh, and he marches up to the church door in the town of Wittenberg where he was teaching. And he nails up on the door his 95 uh, theses. It was kind of like someone ranting on Twitter. If he'd had Twitter, he would have had a field day. But, he didn't have Twitter, he had the church door. He puts these 95 theses uh, on the door. I believe that his intention was not to cause a break in the Catholic church. I think he sincerely wanted to reform the Catholic church, to remain Catholic. And, but his, his defiance uh, touched off um, what later became known as the Protestant Reformation. Um, there were a whole bunch of princes in Germany who couldn't wait to break away from the Roman Catholic Church and to stop paying the 10% tax to, the, to Rome. Uh, and so they seized on this as an opportunity to kind of declare independence religiously. And so uh, Germany was plunged into religious division, chaos, and eventually war where different principalities had to choose whether they were Protestant or Catholic. Um, the Thirty Years' War, the Hundred Years' War were connected to this uh, Reformation. Um, the key issues for Martin Luther were these, and they became important in the Reformation throughout Europe. One was that people should be able to worship in their own language, uh, not in Latin. Most uh, uneducated people couldn't speak Latin. Uh, the Bible should be written and published in people's own language and available to ordinary Christians. This was illegal 
in the time of Martin Luther, it was punishable by death to translate and have a copy of the Bible. Luther believed that clergy should be married. He quickly got married <laughs> as soon as he could. Um, and uh, he also believed that the church should maintain the sacraments, that they were incredibly important. Um, he believed that, um, and this became a, a touch point, that there should still be ordained clergy. Later Protestants rejected that idea. So uh, after Luther, you have this, this cascade of kind of now that the, the, there was a wall in the, uh, a breach in the, in the dam, the water comes flowing out and people came up with all kinds of ideas, um, including no clergy, um, no sacraments. Um, and you see that today in the wide, wide variety of Protestant denominations from very anti-sacramental, anti-liturgical um, churches with no stained glass, no liturgy, no tradition, just kind of whatever the Bible says is it, um, to very Catholic seeming, sort of like Episcopalians. Um, but for Luther, the key issue was theological, that uh, it really came down to how we are saved, how we are saved from our sins. Are we saved through our own works by living lives that are good and holy and perfect? Or are we saved by God's grace alone. And Luther came down very solidly on we are saved by grace, uh, by the grace of God alone. Nothing we do can earn salvation um, and we are saved by that. So that becomes, those are in a nutshell, some of the, the concepts that Luther uh, was articulating in the Protestant Reformation. Sharon, does that give you a little help? Yes, thank you. Um, but the Protestant Reformation, as I said, takes many, many forms, and uh, it plays out in Britain very interestingly as well. So let's turn back to uh, Britain. So Henry VIII, uh, who, who uh, was the king, uh, his father, Henry VII, um, after a long, bloody conflict called the Wars of the Roses, Henry VII emerged triumphant and assassinated all the relatives of his rivals, cementing his own power <laughs> and paved the way for his son, Henry VIII, to become king. Henry VIII was raised as a Renaissance prince. He played music, he wrote music, he wrote poetry, he was highly educated um, and kind of the, the perfect image of the Renaissance man. He was also a devout Roman Catholic. And so when he heard about what Luther had done, he wrote a book, a little booklet uh, condemning Luther. And so the Pope named him Defender of the Faith, which became very ironic uh, very shortly. <laughs> uh, but Henry had problems you probably heard about with his marriage. Um, his brother Arthur was supposed to be king. Arthur died young. And so Henry married uh, Arthur's wife to cement a political alliance with Spain. Arthur had married Catherine of Aragon who was heir to the uh, Spanish throne and a relative of the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and so this was a very important political match and the powers that be decided that Henry, who was now gonna be king unexpectedly, should still marry his brother's wife, which was fine, except she had no sons. And so the most important thing for a king is to have a son no son, no son. Finally, a daughter is born, uh, Mary, but no son. And so Henry gets frustrated and decides that he needs a son. Uh, and also he uh, had an eye for the ladies apparently. And so he asks the Pope for an annulment. The problem is the Pope at the time was Catherine's cousin. And the Pope was not gonna grant an annulment to Henry uh, because he was on Catherine's side. And so he rejects the request. Henry says, what about a divorce? The Pope says, no way. And so Henry decides to divorce her anyway. 
And this sets off a religious and political crisis in England. Um, Henry also was fighting wars with France and needed money. And he thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could save that 10% tax we're paying to Rome? That would help fund my army for a while. And so uh, for, for all these reasons, political, economic, and religious, uh, Henry uh, divorces Catherine, he's excommunicated. Um, he eventually, he has all these, uh, you can see in the picture here, he has six wives. I always learned that was uh, divorced, uh, I can't remember what, what order they're in. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. So he has six wives, and uh, only one of them gives him a son. He has, with his second wife, Anne Boleyn, he has another daughter. He's cursed with daughters, and that's Elizabeth. Finally, Jane Seymour gives him a son, Edward, um, and then he kills uh, Jane Seymour. Uh, but... Uh, but uh, Henry eventually dies. He dies a Catholic. He never became Protestant. This is a, a fallacy that people don't know. But uh, he, he dies a Catholic. He's excommunicated, but he dies a Catholic. But he has lots of Protestant sympathies. And so before he dies, he names the regents, those who are going to run the country for his young son. Almost all of them are Protestants. And so England is in this moment of great um, turmoil religiously. When Henry dies, nobody knows what's going to happen. So what happens? Edward VI becomes king, uh, and England becomes officially a Protestant country. The regents make sure that we are finally severing the knot with Rome, and England's becoming Protestant like parts of Germany uh, and other places. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had been consecrated as a Catholic Archbishop, um, he is now a Protestant sympathizer, and he creates the first Book of Common Prayer in 1549. Uh, it is essentially a translation and updating of the Roman Missal, and he includes the sacraments of the Holy Eucharist and baptism, as well as morning and evening prayer. He, he who is a genius, really. He took all those monastic services that the monks were saying uh, seven times a day, and he condensed them into one set of prayers for the morning and one set for the evening, because he believed every lay person could live a holy life by praying in the morning and the evening, and then coming to church on Sundays. Um, but it's essentially a Catholic light book. It's not Protestant in its theology. It's very Catholic in its understanding of the sacraments. And Edward's regents didn't like it. They read this new prayer book. It became the official uh, worship of England, but it was too Catholic for them. They wanted something more like what uh, the radical Protestants were doing in Europe. And so they uh, forced Cranmer to publish a new prayer book in 1552 uh, this one much more Protestant in its theology. They could have had their way and made England almost like a Presbyterian country, but Edward died. He was sickly, he fell ill, and he died in 1553. And so who's going to take charge? Oh, guess what? The next person in line is Mary. Mary, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. Mary, who is a devout Catholic, and Mary, who immediately restores England to being a Roman Catholic country, at least partly. Um, she um, famously or infamously uh, burned 283 Protestants at the stake, <laughs> including Thomas Cranmer. He had recanted, but then he uh, decided that was not, to had no integrity. And so he uh, eventually was burned with other leading churchmen at the stake. Um, and he, he stuck, apparently by tradition, he, when he was being burned at the stake, the hand that he had written his recantation with, he stuck that into the flames first uh, as an act of defiance. Um, so fun times in England um, as uh, first Catholics and then Protestants are burned at the stake. But Mary didn't last very long. <laughs> These were not well kids, I guess, and she died of the flu in 1558. 
And so finally, her sister, her younger sister, Elizabeth, who was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, uh, becomes queen in 1558. And Elizabeth lasts. She remains queen for nearly 50 years and cements uh, the Protestant Reformation in England. Uh, she oversaw um, this conflict. She really brought resolution to the conflict between loyal Catholics on the one hand, who had grown up Catholic, who had been happy when Mary was queen, and then the radical Protestants on the other side, who we often call Puritans now. You know, you think of the, the those who came to the Mass Massachusetts, uh, the Pilgrims. The Pilgrims were English Puritans, right? <laughs> who were the descendants of these radical Protestants uh, from this period. And Elizabeth is trying to bring peace. She's a very skilled politician and she wants to bring harmony between these two diametrically opposed groups in her country. And so she publishes a new prayer book, right? We had 1549, 1552, <laughs> and now in 1559, we get a third prayer book. And this one is right down the middle. If 1549 was Catholic and 1552 was Protestant, this one's aiming right down the middle of the goalposts. She famously said that she had no desire to make a window into people's minds. You know, I, you can believe what you want, believe Catholic, believe Protestant, but show up at church and pray with my prayer book. That's all I ask. Um, and so uh, she uh, establishes this kind of what we call the via media, the middle way between Protestantism and Catholicism, which is a defining characteristic of Anglicanism and the Episcopal Church, the via media between Catholic and Protestant, or I like to think bringing ele the elements of both Protestant and Catholic together. Uh, Spain tries one more time, right? Spain is still mad about uh, Catherine of Aragon and Mary. And so uh, King Philip, sends the Armada in 1588 to conquer Britain and make Britain Catholic again. And really inexplicably, this is a fascinating part of history. I don't know, Darlene, if you studied this, that Armada should have been successful. Yeah, It was, yeah. It was an amazing, uh, it was the mightiest Armada then known in the world. And it totally fell apart as it came to England. Storm after storm, um, it, it just was, unable to prevail. And so the last uh, chance to get rid of Elizabeth and reestablish Catholicism really dies, uh, drowns with the Spanish Armada in 1588. So I want to give you a quick example of what I mean by the different theology in the prayer books. So this is, these were the words that the priest said um, at the Eucharist. So after the blessing of the bread and wine, when it, the Eucharist was being administered, in Cranmer's first prayer book, this is what the priest would say. And someone read that first sentence for us. I'm tired of talking. You're probably tired of hearing me. Someone read that first one. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. So tell me what those words mean to you. Uh... <laughs> What does it say about what's happening in the Eucharist? That it's protecting you, the receiver. Yeah, it's got power, right? This is, this is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the real thing. Mm -hmm. And it's preserving your body and soul. So this is, this is very, I would say, uh, Catholic in its, in its basic understanding of the, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And then in 1552, who wants to read that next one? Remembrance that Christ died for thee and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. So, All right, so I, hi I highlighted some words there, but what does this say to you? So at this point, you're saying in remembrance, yeah, you're taking away the power from what the first in 1549, they were saying that the Eucharist has power. Here, it's just a token 
of the act. That's right. So in keeping with Protestant theologians, they're saying, oh no, there's no real presence. We're just remembering what happened at the Last Supper. And you're not being preserved. Your body and soul is not being changed or preserved by this. You're, you're receiving it by faith, right? It's a very, it's like a diametrically opposed idea. And so, so what I absolutely love is in Elizabeth's prayer book in 1549, look what they do. <laughs> the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance. I'm sorry, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee and feed on him in thy heart with, by faith, with thanksgiving. So, so what did Elizabeth do? Combine together. She, she just took two opposite ideas and said, fine, we'll just have them both. <laughs> yeah. Now, I grew up with this prayer book. This was the prayer book of my childhood. Um, the 1928 American book basically just took this exact wording. And I never thought twice about it. I never really thought that I was hearing two opposite ideas when I was receiving communion. It's when you put it, when you look at it like this, it's kind of jarring in a way how how different the um, the ideas are. But think about what Elizabeth was trying to do. She was trying to say to people, hey, if you come to church and in your heart you are a devout Catholic, you believe in the real presence of Christ, you believe in the sacramental nature of the church, great. This church is for you. You can pray with this prayer book. And hey, if you've been persuaded by Martin Luther and those crazy Protestants down in Europe, and you believe that this is just a memorial, um, this church is for you, you can pray with this prayer book you can come and find what you're looking for. It's, it's, a, it's a deft political move. <laughs> and, and this is the, what happens in what's called the Elizabethan settlement. She brings these two uh, conflicting groups together. And through the sheer force of her will, she makes England uh, worship together, even though they were still, I mean, all the tension was still there. Uh, but but while she was queen, by gum, people were going to worship together <laughs> and like it. <laughs> and the act of uniformity meant that you were required by law to go to church, and you were required by law to use this prayer book. And she had a theologian who wrote a book of homilies, so even the sermons that you heard had been approved by the Archbishop of Canterbury or written by him. So you are getting the official religion of the state um, in, your, uh, in your church on Sunday. Unlike other parts of Europe, the Protestant Reformation in England is definitely a top-down reformation. This is coming from the queen and imposed through the bishops and the uh, clergy to the people. This was not a bubbling up kind of reformation that you see in some other places. All right, so Elizabeth dies. She, they always wanted her to get married and have kids. She never did. She played off her suitors against each other um, and never got married. And so when she died, the closest relative was her cousin who was the King of Scotland and he became the king of Scotland and England. And the Stuart dynasty proved incredibly unpopular, uh, at least mostly, some of them were popular. Charles I, James's son, uh, was beheaded and the Protestants in parliament finally took over. They finally got to kick out the Anglicans and take over. So from 1649 to 1660, Oliver Cromwell is the Lord Protector of England and the Protestant parliament is in charge. When Cromwell died, uh, Parliament was sick of the Puritans. <laughs> and so they invite Charles II to become king uh, and to reestablish the Church of England, okay? So 
this Puritan experiment turned out to be miserable for everybody. And so the uh, Church of England is reestablished and uh, Charles II, um, who was very popular, he was a party animal. I mean, this was the time of, of immense lavish parties in, in the, the palace. And, but anyway, a new prayer book is published in 1662. And that's the last official prayer book in England. That is still the official prayer book in England. No one uses it. They use modern uh, versions of worship. But the official prayer book is still 1662. Unfortunately, Charles's son, James II, um, maybe not unfortunately from your perspective, but he uh, was um, uh, a proponent of the divine right of kings. He believed that he had the absolute right to determine all decisions in England, including religious ones. And he decided that uh, Anglicanism should go and that Roman Catholicism should be reinstated. The parliament did not want to have another religious war. And so they uh, booted James II. So parliament had grown very powerful and they were able to fire the king and to invite his daughter, Mary, and her husband, William. So William and Mary College uh, comes from these two. Uh, William and Mary become the king and queen of England and peace uh, resumes in the country. All right, moving quickly because it's eight o'clock. Now, what about America? So in this period of the 1600s, um, we have the Puritans coming to, the Pilgrims coming to Massachusetts. We have um, settlements in Virginia and the Carolinas. Uh, the settlement of the 13 colonies in uh, America. Uh, and all of these colonies, um, which were uh, representing many of the European nations, uh, are also representing many of the religious thought, uh, the variety of religious thought, religious thought in Europe. And so we have this amazing diversity in early America of Anglicans, Congregationalists, who were the Puritans, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Baptists, Roman Catholics, Quakers, Shakers, Mennonites, and many others settling in different places in the colonies. I like this map because it just gives you a little flavor of where they were uh, scattered all over. <clears throat> in uh, the Anglicans, the Church of England folks in America, um, they, they were a missionary area for the Church of England. So there were no American bishops. All Anglicans were under the authority of the Bishop of London and there were very few local clergy. Many of the clergy came as missionaries through these societies called the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel and the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge. Uh, one of those priests was John Wesley, who later became the founder of the Methodist Church. Um, but the problem was, um, or not the problem, but one of the consequences was that uh, because there were so few local clergy because clergy would come and go as missionaries, um, lay people and lay leadership became incredibly important in the American uh, version of Anglicanism. The vestry, the elected leadership of a parish, the wardens like Jonathan and John, they become very powerful, uh, much more so than, than lay people in England or in other parts of the British Empire. Uh, another crisis happens in July 4th, 1776. America declares independence from Britain. Uh, this causes a, a crisis in the church because all those Anglican clergy, uh, the ones in America as well as the ones in England, had sworn an oath in their ordination to the King of England. And so what do you do when your country has declared independence and you have declared your allegiance to the King? So they either had to forswear their oath and stay in America, or they would flee to Canada or uh, Britain. So there were even fewer clergy uh, left in America. And um, all of the church was cut off from the Bishop of London. And so they had to kind of come up with a way to have a church. What are we going to do? So they create the Episcopal Church. And we're going to kind of end with this today. In 1784... Uh, Samuel Seabury from Connecticut, who had been petitioning for years the Archbishop of Canterbury to consecrate him a bishop, 
uh, he'd been elected by the church in uh, New England. Um, and the Archbishop of Canterbury said, no way, you're a bunch of rebels. I'm not consecrating you. Um, and so he brokered a deal <laughs> with the Scottish bishops who didn't ha had no love for England and were separating themselves as well and had become the Episcopal Church of Scotland. He was consecrated in um, Aberdeen uh, at, by three Scottish bishops. And one consequence of that, just a little trivia, um, they required him in exchange for this uh, ordination. They said, you have to adopt our version of the prayer book, not the English version. And so the very first American um, prayer book uh, followed the order of the Scottish prayer book, not the English one. That's really trivial, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, there's a general convention of the church in 1785. Um, doesn't do much because uh, Seabury uh, and the New Englanders didn't like it, but they named the church the Protestant Episcopal Church. There's another general convention. Um, and uh, at that point, the Archbishop of Canterbury is afraid that the whole American church is going to go Scottish. And so he agrees to consecrate the next two American bishops, um, William White from uh, Philadelphia and Samuel Provost from New York. And then in 1789, we have the first real general convention of the church. Um, William White is named presiding bishop, and we create the structure of the Episcopal Church, which we'll talk about in more detail um, uh, next week. Um, and the Book of Common Prayer is published in American form. So our first American prayer book is 1789. It's also our first general convention uh, and really the beginning of the Episcopal Church in America. So the church uh, now mirrors the new American government. Unlike the English system with the Archbishop of Canterbury and that more medieval structure, um, the new church is going to follow the American government because some of the same people who were creating the American constitution were also creating the Episcopal Church. We're going to keep the Catholic and Anglican orders of ministry, bishops, priests, and deacons. But we're going to tie that hierarchical system now to an American-style representative democracy. Uh, we're going to keep the importance of lay leadership. Um, and we're going to make not the Pope, not the Archbishop of Canterbury, but the General Convention is the ultimate authority over church worship and doctrine and practice. So there's a house of bishops like the Senate. All the bishops operate in that kind of more uh, traditional role. And then the house of deputies, which is elected priests, deacons, and lay people from the various parishes and dioceses. And all legislation has to be passed by both the bishops and the deputies in order to become official policy. The presiding bishop, not an archbishop, but a presiding bishop like a president is the person who presides over the House of Bishops and is kind of the figurehead for uh, the whole Episcopal Church. And our current presiding bishop is Michael Curry. And in our parishes, we have a rector or a vicar or a priest in charge or an interim, depending on what's going on. Um, I think I've been all of those things in my career. <laughs> we have a senior warden, wave Jonathan. Um, and we have a junior warden, wave John, um, in our, in our parish, it's not everywhere, but in our parish, the junior warden typically has a, a kind of oversight over buildings and grounds and the senior warden, uh, assists the rector in kind of oversight over the parish uh, ministry and, uh, programs. The vestry are lay leaders who are elected by our annual meeting. So all the members of the parish gather at the end of January and elect uh, members to the vestry. Um, vestry members just need to be um, baptized members of the church in good standing. Um, we typically ask that you've been a member for a year or more. So many of you can, not too long from now, can be eligible to run for vestry. <laughs> we have a staff, so there are a few people that are paid um, to work at the church. And then we have a variety of committees. Um, and so I like to think of us as a partnership 
with the hierarchy and the bishop and the priest working in conjunction with alongside the lay leadership of the church as equals. And that's the way it works best. So Jonathan and I have been trying to make sure we alternate leading our vestry meetings. So it's not just me talking all the time. Anything you want to say about that, Jonathan? No, I would agree. Um, and I think it's a good balance, um, you know, to have sort of that joint leadership. Um, you know, not only does it, you know, spread the load a little bit, but it also it does reinforce that this isn't um, a, a completely hierarchical organization. Not that you're terribly hierarchical yourself, but, um, you know, we're actually practicing what we uh, preach. John, anything you want to add? Uh, no, not really. <clears throat> I'm uh, wearing out. <laughs> yeah, John has been a tireless uh, junior warden, <laughs> and I think he's feeling the burden of that and needing some help. So if anyone loves property, buildings, and grounds, call John. <laughs> I think the, the problem is, you know, we're, nobody's at the church to see eye to eye when I need something, you know, it's... it's the communications is, is a little different when you're everybody's on Zoom. So mm -hmm. back together, I think we'll we'll have a little better time of of communicating. So other than that, I enjoy what I'm doing, but it's wearing me out. <laughs> All right. So that's that's the whirlwind tour. Um, I know it's getting late, but if you have particular questions or reflections, please do uh, mention them and then we'll uh, answer them tonight or we can pick them up next week too. So I just so the only Archbishop in all of the Episcopal and Anglican Church is the Archbishop of Canterbury, right? There is an Archbishop, there is an Archbishop of York. Okay. Those are the two traditional uh, seats of power in England. And it kind of reflects, if you remember the Saxon Church in the North um, and St. Columba and St. Aidan and all those, that York became the center of the northern part of English Christianity and Canterbury in the south. And because Canterbury was where St. Augustine landed, they had primacy. So the Archbishop of Canterbury is kind of the figurehead for the whole of the Anglican communion. And the Anglican communion really is all the churches who have their origin in the Church of England, because the British Empire spread out all over. So there are Anglicans in Africa, in every continent, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, you, know, you name it. And they all look to the Archbishop of Canterbury as their kind of figurehead, um, yeah, been, but I've, he has no authority over us. Right. Yeah, I've been to York and I was in York Minster. It's a beautiful cathedral there. Oh, stunning, yeah, yeah. So I guess the, the, the thing that still confuses me a little bit is the relationship between the American Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of England. Great, good question. And then I saw Darlene had her hand up. So um, in, at the Revolutionary War, we severed the connection between the uh, Church of England and the Episcopal Church in America. Um, we had from that day forward, complete autonomy over how we ran our affairs. We published our own prayer books. We ordained our own clergy once we had bishops. Um, and we looked to England as a kind. So we became the first of many um, churches which make up the Anglican communion, which is a voluntary association of Anglican churches that look to their origin in England but who are independent national churches. So the Episcopal Church of Scotland is an independent church. The Anglican Church in Wales is independent. The Anglican Church of Canada, the Anglican Church in Nigeria, the Anglican Church in Australia, they're all part of that Anglican communion, but all separate uh, autonomous churches. And so uh, the Church of England uh, we, we started ordaining women in 1977, and England started doing it in, I think, 1990. So, um, so we, we did not wait for the blessing of the Archbishop of Canterbury um, to do that, and he was not that happy about it, really.
at the time. Darlene. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on saints. I know as a Catholic, um, there have been some take backs. Like we used to have a St. Christopher, he was right. a patron saint of travelers, and then they decided that he wasn't a saint. So I just wondered what the process was for uh, this, the, you know, Episcopal Church, as far as how, what process they <laughs> use to determine sainthood. It's, it's a great question. My wife is on the committee uh, for the okay. National Church that's been working on that. Um, so we inherited, I would say, the, the biblical saints, you know, like the apostles. We inherited the great medieval saints like St. Saint Francis, um, and they all became part of our calendar of saints. And then um, we started adding saints. Now, we don't have a process where we look for miracles. Um, our process is they need to be proposed to and voted on by the general convention. And so in modern times, there have been some modern saints who have been brought up by local people. So for instance, there was a young seminarian from uh, the Episcopal Theological Seminary in Boston, and he became part of the civil rights movement and went down as a freedom rider and then stayed and worked with local um, voting rights groups in, I think it was Alabama. And uh, on a particular day, he was with a young African-American girl. And as they came out of a store, they saw that they were being ambushed by white supremacists. And so he jumped in front of the girl and was shot and killed. And so the general convention, after receiving the application, decided that he should be added to our calendar of saints called Lesser Feasts and Fasts. Um, and so he's a saint. Now, what does saint mean? I think, uh, I think it's varied over history, but it's a really great question, Darlene. So we have the great saints of, of the Catholic tradition, and we have some modern local saints. When we do noonday prayer, we remember whoever the saint of the day is. And Paul and, and Judy have a book, which is mostly Catholic saints. Mm -hmm. And about like half the time, it's the same saint from mm -hmm. their book as it is in our calendar. Mm -hmm. And about half the time, it's someone uh, sometimes none of us have heard of. <laughs> but we, we added recently, we tried to add a lot more um, women and people of other cultures uh, because we realized so many of our saints were, um, were male. Uh, and so that caused a little bit of confusion because now suddenly we had different lists of people um, from other denominations and, and cultures. And so we're, we're kind of going through a sifting right now, Darlene. It's a little confusing. I'm not even sure what our official list of saints is. And I'm married to someone on the committee. So. <laughs> I'll ask for Christopher's in or out because I'd like to know if I have to ditch my St. Christopher medal. I've always kept it in my car, even when the vet told me he wasn't a saint anymore. <laughs> I, if it works for you, I'd keep it, Darlene. Uh, head, you, head's your best. I need all the help I can get. I would, I would say one, one uh, emphasis during the Reformation was, to be clear, the Anglicans were clear that we were praying to God, and we were praying with the saints. So when you pray, you might ask a saint to intercede for you, but you're not really praying to the saint. You're just saying, like, I think of the Virgin Mary, the most beloved of all the saints. You know, you think, hey, can you get a good word in with your son for me? You know, we're not, a, you know, we're not worshiping Mary, but we are, um, we're asking for her help. That's the way I think of praying with the saints. Is well, we're that, asking... that, is one of the, that is one of the differences, too, between mm -hmm. yeah, these two churches. And there is just a less emphasis on saints in the Episcopal Church. That's some of our Protestant side is direct access to God uh, through Jesus is emphasized. But we kept the tradition of saints, and they're very important in our, in our worship life. And you can continue to pray to St. Christopher. Go for it. Thank you. <laughs> My uh, one daughter lives in... Um... Gibsonia, Pennsylvania, and just up the street from her is a church that it says Anglican Church. Mm -hmm. 
what does why how is that different okay so um while the episcopal church was changing and adapting we started ordaining women in 1977 we adopted a new prayer book uh in 1976 and 79 that had modern language instead of the old elizabethan language and a bunch of our more traditional folks didn't like either of those things. They didn't like the new language. They didn't like women clergy. And then when we started ordaining gay and lesbian people, uh, they completely lost their minds. And so they said, hey, we are Anglican. We believe in that tradition, but we can't be part of this Episcopal church because they've gone off the deep end and become too liberal. And so they created a series of breakaway uh, denominations. There's a charismatic Episcopal church, which embraced the Pentecostal revival. So they're Episcopalians who are Pentecostalists, and they couldn't stay in the Episcopal church for whatever reason. There are 1928 prayer book churches. If you go to Arizona, it doesn't say Anglican. They'll say 1928 prayer book, which means they didn't go with the new prayer book in the 70s. They wanted the old prayer book with the Elizabethan language. We have Anglicans who are affiliated with uh, some churches in Africa who were particularly against uh, or, uh, homosexuality. Uh, and so they created their own Anglican uh, identity separate from the Episcopal church. Um, I mean, I think you see this in every denomination, uh, sort of splinter groups who, who decide they can't stay as much as we want everybody to stay, they, they had to walk apart. So that, that's why Anglican. I think there's one in Rochester. I, I heard a rumor that there was a guy starting an Anglican church that worships at St. John Lutheran Church in their chapel, but I, I haven't confirmed that. Maybe uh, just a comment, final comment here. Uh, going back to your, uh, uh, your financial machine there and talking about purgatory and being able to pay for things. You know, growing up and going to... Uh, parochial school as uh, a child. Uh, uh, last week, I in jest said, what happened to ever, whatever happened to limbo? Well, you know, growing up, we would bring in our nickels and dimes so that we could save all those pagan babies from limbo. You know, yeah. so it hasn't, it, it hasn't been so, so far removed. But, uh, so we didn't, we didn't get into it, but, you know, St. Augustine of Hippo was a proponent of the idea of original sin. So the idea was when you're born into this mortal world, uh, you are already tainted with original sin. You know, the sin of Adam and Eve, their rebellion against God. And so you're, you're, you've got that original sin without ever choosing evil or, or sin. You've just got it. And so how do you wipe away that original sin? It's through baptism. But what happens if you're not baptized, right? And hence the church had to come up with a place. What do you do with babies who are not, they haven't sinned, right? But they also haven't er erased original sin. So they came up with this idea of limbo where the virtuous pagans would go. If you ever want to read a great depiction of this, it's Dante's Inferno. Because Dante took that medieval idea of purgatory and limbo and hell and heaven, and he put it in this amazing poem, the, the, the Divine Comedy, and he kind of lays it all out like that. But there's virtuous pagans who were never baptized, you know, those, those wonderful examples of humanity uh, who lived before Christ. Well, where do they go? They can't go to heaven if they're not baptized. They're not bad enough for hell. So it's limbo or purgatory. After three months, I call my grandkids pagan babies till they get unbaptized. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good guilt trip, right? Yeah. <laughs> so is, is that concept of original sin, does, is that part of this tradition too? Okay, so great question. So at the time of the Reformation, Cranmer and others decide that they have to publish the beliefs of the church and they come up with something called the 39 articles and this is what all anglicans have to believe at that time and they included which books of the bible were considered authoritative and what doctrines were there and so they reject purgatory purgatory's out 
but original sin is kind of still in. They like the idea of original sin. <laughs> modern Epis the modern Episcopal Church does not have any official list of beliefs except for <laughs> the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And so theologians, clergy, lay people are free to think about and debate limbo, purgatory, original sin. And even if we all came up with different opinions about it, we would still all be okay theologically because we don't, I, I go back to Queen Elizabeth I. I have no desire to make a window into people's minds, right? You have the ability to think about and come up with your own conclusions. You read the Bible, you live in the community of the church, you live in the world, you get to make up your own mind about these questions. And so I like to think when I'm preaching on Sunday, other people are thinking to themselves, hey, I wanna, I disagree with that. I agree, with, you know, it, it's, it's a dialogue with your mind and your conscience. Uh, it's not the be all and end all, right? So, so we don't have an official position on original sin. I've always thought it's kind of a tough doctrine myself, but, but then I look at little kids and they're little monsters. So maybe, the, maybe it's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, my um, mother's parents, my grandmother was Catholic and my grandfather had been raised in, and went to church with his parents in a Baptist church. But amazingly, they never had him baptized. And so when my grandfather was dying, my mother was the one of his nine kids that was in the hospital. And she was so upset that he wasn't baptized. And she called um, the parish that we grew up in, where she still attended. And the priest wasn't able to get there. And he said to her, um, he said, he said, you know, Anna, anybody can baptize. He said, if you, because my mother baptized him. He said, you baptized your father, he said, but um, he said, your soul is never an infant. It's mature from the time you're conceived. And he said, so mm -hmm. baptism by desire, he said, the fact that my father, my grandfather had asked my mother about it mm -hmm. and reminded her that he wasn't baptized. He said, the fact that he asked, it's done. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was, you know, that's the way I look at it. So that's, so that's, no, I don't, I've never, I've never heard that before, Karen, but I love it. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, he oh. was an Irish priest. <laughs> <laughs> we have that provision too that in an emergency, any lay person can baptize uh, somebody. Um, the idea is that it it makes the most sense in the context of the service and the church and the theology, but you know, in a pinch. All right, we got to stop. It's late. You could be probably tired. Um, uh -huh. Next week we will do session two which was what Episcopalians believe. And we can delve more deeply into some of these questions um, and look at the, the way the Anglican church and then the Episcopal church kind of figured out how to, how to figure out what to think and believe and do. So um, what does that via media, that middle way look like in practice? So that's what we'll talk about next time. Bring more questions. I love the questions. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Good night. 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 Safe drive, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Good night. Bye-bye. Okay, Katie. Okay. 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 Okay.